वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम शर्मिला मजुमदार एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कल्याणी वेस्ट बेंगल दिस मॉड्यूल इज कॉल्ड स्लेव नैरेटिव्स इट इज अ पार्ट ऑफ योर अमेरिकन लिटरेचर सिलेबस these modules are designed for students who don't have the privilege of attending a regular classroom and interacting with the teacher so uh, i shall try to interact as much as possible and try to explain things that are there in the modules now before we start let me tell you something that slave narratives have come uh in a big way as a part of american literature syllabus but even 50 years back they were not considered to be such not that slave narratives are new things slave narratives have were being written for the last more than 200 years but you know they were not considered part of regular canonical syllabus it's only a uh, last for 50 years during the last 50 years that slave narratives come in a big way to form an integral part of american literature course the origin uh, as i was telling you that slave narratives were being written for over 250 years so around middle of the 17th century abolitionist texts condemning slavery started appearing in england and america so it's the middle of the 17th century which is around 1650 Slave narratives emerged as a form of abolitionist literature around middle of the 18th century. Several texts exploring the predicament of slaves in North America started to surface. Slave narratives are memoirs written by former slaves or fugitives. These narratives could be full-length books, transcribed interviews or newspaper articles. Now if you remember your Huckleberry Finn you know what a fugitive slave is so there were slaves who were freed there were slaves who escaped and these are the people who sometimes wrote down their narrative so this is what is primarily slave narrative early slave narratives borrowed from King James Bible sermonizing traditions devotional books like pilgrim's progress the rhetoric of abolitionism the traditions of the captivity narrative spiritual autobiography now you know king james the uh, first arranged for the bible to be translated into english it was called the vulgate before that the bible was not in english so you know what happened ordinary people who didn't have any latin could read the bible now so that was a major source and now you are probably familiar with bunyan's book pilgrim's progress so that was another uh, inspiration and the rhetoric of abolitionism you know what is meant by abolitionism is abolition means to do away with so abolitionism is the discourse of doing away with something in this case it is slavery so the abolitionists were people who advocated doing away with slavery and abolitionism is the is their discourse which is sometimes political uh, which can be political activism and which can be political philosophy as well and there were the traditions of captivity narrative and spiritual autobiography uh, one of the earliest slave narratives you can read now on the screen is britain hammond's narrative of the uncommon sufferings and surprising deliverance of britain hammond a negro man now you see there is a word negro which is considered to be politically incorrect today but when it was written because this is supposed to be the first american slave narrative the first american slave narrative published in boston in 1760 so you know it was perfectly all right to call himself a negro and the people who read it they didn't uh, they didn't find it objectionable but something which will be considered highly improper and politically incorrect today the next is 
are narrative of the most remarkable particulars in the life of James Albert Ucaso Groniso an African prince the first narrative to address the evils of slavery in direct terms which appeared in london in 1770 so you see it is uh, an um, african prince who probably himself was not a slave but he talked about the evils of slavery how the colonialists were uh, importing african slaves to america and from america to the markets of uh, europe and so this was published in london a narrative of the lord's wonderful dealings with john marrant now you know this is a book which in a way uh, exposes the uh, scheme which um, which the slave merchants took up to justify through bible and through the discourses of christianity uh, their business in slave market olauda equino interesting narrative of the life of olauda equino or gustavas vasa the african uh, you see it is pub- it was published in 1789 and you can also note that these narratives were coming in quick successions so these things were being written the fact is they were not taken note of by the reading public by university dons by the critics but these people were writing all these narratives right from the middle of the 18th century and they were coming in reasonably quick succession antebellum narratives pitched for full humanity of the africans and focused on deprivation of the slave of basic needs lack of adequate food clothing and shelter denial of basic familial rights hopped on the atrocities of the slave masters scenes of whipping sexual exploitation of the slaves commented on the use of christianity as a tool to exploit the slaves had the political agenda of abolitionism so antebellum is the period referred to here which corresponds to the pre civil war years in america American Civil War started in 1861 and ended in 1865. American Civil War was primarily fought on the issue of slavery because you know by the middle of the 19th century America North was highly industrialized and they did not need slaves to run their production. they run their factories but the american south was largely dependent was largely agricultural and dependent on their earnings from the cotton plantations there were huge cotton plantations on the american south and these african slaves worked on these cotton plantations now you see the north american and uh, north americans in the sense that the people who lived in the northern part of the united states of america they were abolitionists well ideologically they were abolitionists and they didn't have the financial constraint to support slavery but the southern part of the united states of america were constrained to support the uh, support slavery because they badly needed this um african slaves to work on the cotton plantations mm, uh, i hope all of you have watched that movie uh, gun with the wind that uh, describes the life on a cotton plantation in the american south so the abolitionists were people from the industrialized part of america's north and the confederate army as they were called were supported by cotton plantation owning americans living below the imaginary mason dixon line who were owners of huge cotton plantations narrative of the life of frederick douglas it was published in 1845 
the life of Frederick Douglass is probably the best known slave narrative and has made its way into the curriculum of many universities. The History of Mary Prince, first slave narrative by a woman, appeared in 1835. Mary Prince dictated her story to Susanna Strickland. Now you can see that Mary Prince's narrative is antebellum. It was published in 1835 only. Mary Prince was illiterate and so she could not write. She narrated her story to Susanna Strickland who wrote it down for her. Post-Civil War Narratives Popularity of the slave narratives went down. A shift in narrative pattern. Postbellum narratives focused on some distinctive acts on part of the freed slaves. A milder form of slavery is depicted. Slave women often occupy central role. Now you can see the antebellum or pre-civil war slave narratives. They were uh, more frequent in uh, frequent and they were real in the sense that real uh, slaves either wrote them these down or narrated their stories to people who could read uh, the stories down for them. But what happened in the post bellum period that the popularity of the slave narratives went down for the understandable reason that slavery was abolished. So, legally nobody could own a slave though it has to be admitted that there were milder forms of slavery still uh, there in the American South. And what happened, you know, in the post bellum period, the slave narratives focused on the people who were already freed and what, how they were being integrated to the mainstream American life. And uh, the antebellum slave narratives were either written by fugitive slaves, you remember the story of your, of the novel Huckleberry Finn and the slaves who were occasionally freed. But post bellum narratives are written by people who have all been freed and how they were trying to integrate to the mainstream American life. And another important thing is that women came to occupy a central position in these slave narratives. Elizabeth Keckley, behind the scenes or 30 years a slave, and Four Year in the White House was published in 1868. Now, uh, the title is interesting because you see, she says that she has been a slave for 30 years and it is uh, published in 1868. So, three years after the Civil War ended. So, that is post bellum. But Four Year in the White House. House. So, what does she mean to say that it was a milder form of slavery though uh, she has legally been freed uh, at the end of the American Civil War? A Slave Girl's Story being an autobiography of Kate Drumgould, 1898. So, towards the end of the century, the slave narratives were still being written and it was an autobiography by a former slave. Federal Writers Project 2300 first person accounts of slavery and 500 photographs were collected from the former slaves. The collection is now archived in the manuscript and prints and photographs divisions of the Library of Congress. Some of them were transcribed interviews, some were newspaper articles and others book length publications. Now, um, this is what gave actually Philip to uh, the slave narratives being considered an integral part of American literature because as you can see uh, there were 2300 pers first person accounts of slavery. So, these were basically uh, interviews that these people in who are involved in this federal writers project, the interviews they took of the former slaves and so there are 2300 first person accounts and there are 500 photographs and all of these have been archived. So, this is a 
permanent uh, aspect of American social history, political history as well as literature. And some of these interviews were transcribed, they were written down by the people who took the interview and there were of course newspaper articles based on these and there were book length publications as well. And this is very important because this is the project which actually brought slave narratives into focus. Neo-slave narratives, the term neo-slave narrative was coined by novelist Ismail Reed who himself wrote in this genre, his flight to Canada, 1976, being an example. Ashraf H. A. Rashti in Neo-Slave Narratives, Studies in the Social Logic of a Literary Form, 1999, defines it as the genre of, quote, contemporary novels that assume the form and adopt the conventions and take on the first-person voice of antebellum slave narratives. The term received wide circulation in critical circles after it was used by Bernard Bell in the Afro-American novel and its tradition, 1987. Now you can see neo-slave uh, narratives which are not actually actually real slave narratives in the sense that these were not either spoken by or written by the slaves. This is a form, form of novel writing which was adopted in the post bellum period that is after the civil war. So, it is a literary form which some of the novelists adopted and they wrote the, these narratives in the voice of a former uh, slave. So, as if the protagonist was a slave, now he is writing down the narrative. So, there are certain conventions of the slave narratives which were also adopted in these uh, novels. So, slave narratives were narratives, uh, they were not fiction, but neo-slave narratives are novels which are fictions primarily. Black Thunder 1936 by Arna Bontemps written during the depression is considered a precursor of this genre. Margaret Walker's Jubilee 1966 to be the first novel in this genre. Now, you know, depression, the period of depression refers to a period in American history during the early 1930s. There was a complete breakdown in the Wall Street and there was financial crisis. So, American social and political life underwent a considerable change during this period. So, depression is important, it is sometimes referred to as the Great Depression is important in the history of the United States of America. So, now let me summarize what we have discussed so far. First, it is the origin of the slave narratives. You know, slavery was a, has been a part of American history almost from its inception. Uh, because these colonizers who went to uh, Africa, they completely dominated the African people and brought them back to America because America was a huge country, an agricultural country and there were not too many people living on the continent. So, they needed farm hands to uh, work on their farmlands. So, primarily the African slaves were imported to America to serve, to serve in their farmlands. Now, you see from America, the slaves were sometimes imported to Europe as well. By the middle of the 17th century, people started talking about slavery as an evil and uh, Slaves, they started writing about their experiences of being a slave. So, American society was almost uh, vertically divided into two groups of people, the white Americans and the black Africans. And a time came in the middle of the 18th century where people 
that the slaves they started writing about their experiences and there were white people as well who supported their cause who came out to uh, argue their case who favored an abolition of the system of slavery and integrated these African slaves into the mainstream of American life. Now you see it particularly got a Philip in the antebellum period. Now as I have explained antebellum period is the period preceding the American Civil War and I have also tried to explain the political and social background of the American Civil War. You understand what a civil war is? A civil war is a war where the country is uh, divided between themselves and fights one group of people fights another group of people. So, in the north of America which was highly industrialized there were mostly white people who supported abolitionism and there was no financial constraint for them to support abolitionism because they did not employ these slaves on their farm lands. But what happened in the American south you know there were huge cotton plantations and these cotton plantation owners badly needed the slaves to work on their farm lands otherwise they could not uh, continue with their business of cotton plantation. So, they were very much against the abolition of slavery. So, this is the issue primary issue abolition of slavery uh, which was at the heart of American Civil War and the American President Abraham Lincoln during this uh, period of Civil War Abraham Lincoln was a staunch supporter of the abolitionists and he was assassinated by William Booth in a theater because he was uh, a man from the south who did not support abolition because there was some financial constraint as well and he wanted to do away with the American president uh, expecting that killing Abraham Lincoln will automatically uh, give them back the right to retain their slaves. Now you see after the civil war, civil war ended in 1865. There were slave narratives as well, but their demand was less because there were no more slaves. They were freed people who have been freed from slavery. And uh, there, then there another development took place, which is called neo slave narratives. You know, this is an exercise is this is a literary exercise in the sense that slave narratives were uh, narratives written by people who were real life slaves and you know these people they came from the American South so they spoke in a particular dialect. They were mostly people who were illiterate. So, their narratives did not have the kind of form and structure that is expected in a narrative either fictional or non-fictional. But these neo-slave narratives were actually novels, works of fiction and people who wrote these uh, works of fiction have never been slaves themselves. But what did they do when they came to writing these new slave narratives? They were writing a novel but they adopted certain conventions like the kind of dialect that the uh, slaves in the American South used. The same kind of dialect was being used. The disjuncted narrative structure that was there in the slave narratives that was also adopted by these neo-slave uh, narrative writers who are actually novelists and uh, 
you know that continued for some time and probably there are combined effects of this that there were this federal workers project where they recorded the memoirs of the 2300 uh, slaves and collected 500 photographs and then came the uh, new slave narrative writers, all of them put the slave narratives on the American literature syllabus and, and the ag agenda of serious attention by the scholars, critics and social historians.